Despite my best efforts, I am continuously checking my phone as if something new and exciting has appeared. I do it for no reason, and it's absolutely not a good way to stay on task. And a lot of producers approach compression in the same way too, compressing for no reason other than they felt like they should. In this video, we're gonna underline everything we need to know about compression, what it is, when you should use it, and when you shouldn't, and the different types of compression. If you're looking for specific information, check out the timestamps below. And if you want a quick fix to all your compression needs, just visit the Patreon. Let's dive into it. Compression is used to decrease the difference in volume between its loudest and softest parts. In its most basic form, you could actually manually compress by automating volume like this. Here we have this kind of loud transient for the 808, which we could create a curve here and increase the volume here adding a utility to restore its loudness at the end. This is of course super fiddly, so that's why we use a compressor, which is gonna be a godsend when applying to a group or a stem of audio. So how do we use a compressor? I'm gonna use this code pen visual, which is a great way to simulate what compression actually looks like. The threshold is going to set the loudness level at which the compression begins. When the signal hits this level, you can see that it kind of gets clipped here. And the ratio determines the extent of compression once the signal surpasses that threshold. We're currently at an insane ratio of 999. But at a more moderate level of three to one ratio, you can see that the signal is compressed but not fully reduced. To preserve the initial transient, the attack setting controls how quickly the compressor is going to be engaged. Increasing the attack time causes the compressor to respond more slowly, allowing the initial transient to pass through. Right now you can see that the compressor is immediately halting compression, but if we increase the release time, the signal fades out more gradually. This results in the signal continuing to reduce even after it falls below the threshold, creating a smoother curve that makes the signal feel more cohesive. To enhance the signal's volume, makeup gain is used. This makes the final output louder, even if the peak level is lower than the original. This technique can make the signal sound so much more full. Something important to remember is that we don't always need to use compression. It doesn't need to be on every single track. If you're a producer who often uses samples and loops, other producers that provided those samples probably created them in high quality and often mixed and mastered those elements. Someone like Decap is known for loud, fat sounds. There's not necessarily a reason to compress this audio further unless it's for an additional effect. Here I have two Decap samples, this side a kick and this side a rim shot, can you believe? For reference, a normal acoustic rim shot normally looks a little thinner. So this for sure is already a hugely clipped and compressed sample. Adding a compressor to this and pulling that threshold down with a big ratio, medium attack to preserve those transients and medium release with the makeup turned all the way up only results in a sample that is as loud as or lacks a little definition to the original. As you can see, especially with the rim shot, we've actually lost a little of the loudness here. However, using those same settings on the acoustic rim shot sample actually shows that we've increased the dynamic range. Here's the before and after. Oftentimes, producers will get the sound they want from effective limiting over misguided compression. In Ableton, we have two main compressors. The standard compressor, which is terrific for basic needs in decreasing the difference between those lowest and highest peaks, and the glue compressor, which is actually modeled after the SSL 4000 G series hardware compressor, so it introduces some analog characteristics. Fun additional info, there's actually four main analog compression types, which we won't get into today, but some of those qualities can be replicated in the digital space. And there's more on that over at the Patreon, along with a PDF and a handy compressor rack. So for the standard compressor, it's often ideal to use on individual instruments. Now with the glue compressor, well that better dictates the range, which restricts the amount of gain reduction the compressor can apply. It also has a soft clip function that often softens the corners of a waveform, which is not dissimilar to how a tape machine would react to audio in the analog world. With those features in mind, it makes it a great tool for multiple wayward dynamics. So lots of producers utilize it on groups or buses rather than compressing each track individually. I mentioned that there are four main analog compressors, but in the digital world, there are still four more ways that you can compress audio that I think you should get familiar with. Oh, 
I should mention, oh. mastering compression can take a lifetime. So do go easy on yourself when learning all of this. It doesn't have to be like marketing your music, which shouldn't take as long with today's sponsor, DistroKid. You can get your tracks on all of the streaming platforms using DistroKid and access amazing marketing tools. You can create stunning Spotify canvas videos and make sure your audience pre-saves your work with the HyperFollow tool. I've included the link in the description or you can use this QR code wherever it is on the screen to get 7% off your first year and take your music career to a whole new professional level. Now, let's get back to this episode. Oh. The first is Sidechain. Sidechain is a fantastic tool to help you get that ducking effect you hear in a lot of electronic music, but it can also be used to tame frequencies that are maybe fighting for space. You're essentially triggering the compressor from another sound source, which then ducks the volume of the sound source that has the compressor on it. It's better with an example, check this out. An additional fun fact, the legacy sidechain, which I think was introduced in Ableton 7 or 8, produces less pops and clicks than the newer model of glue compression found in 9, 10, and 11, and 12. Now our next device to get familiar with is multiband compression. It's a terrific tool to split frequency bands of an incoming signal and compress each band independently. This allows for more precise compression than your standard compressor, which applies it to the whole frequency band. It's much more aggressive than your standard compressor and used in the wrong way, it can introduce like floor noise that seems to come up in the mix. But because of this, it's also often used as an additional tool to enhance a sound. Check it out on this serum patch. Next up is parallel compression. It's also known as New York compression. And for that, I, I actually don't know why it's called New York compression. So if you do, let me know in the comments. It blends together your compressed signal with a dry signal, which is super helpful when you do want to retain the dynamics of your mix, but introduce some of the characteristics that the compressor brings. Let's look at this technique in practice with a drum stem. Back in my college lecturer days, I used to get my class to imagine compression like reducing a netted ceiling over a sound. Depending on your attack time and the ratio, some of that sound is allowed to pass through the net. However, if you wanted to completely control a dynamic, you could opt for a limiter, which is like applying a concrete ceiling. Nothing can pass. So our fourth compression area is to get familiar with limiting. The ratio on a limiter is way more aggressive and normally helps turn down audio, but in a safe way. Because of this, we often use it at the end of a chain or on our master track, which helps us catch the peaks that may have just snuck through and we can keep them at bay. Once we understand compressors and compression types, we can actually use them in a variety of creative ways too to enhance our sounds, like deessing, reducing sibilance from a mix. Tell me all these sweet lies, sweet lies. Tell me all these sweet lies, sweet lies. Or expanding where we can bring back some life to a previously over compressed sound. I'm in la la love, la la love. I'm in la la love, la la love or gating, which removes sounds that fall below the threshold.
Despite this area being quite overwhelming for producers, once you start to dive into the nitty gritty and understand it, it's actually quite an exciting part of the production process. But on that note, that's it for this episode. And I hope I've made you a little less fearful of compression and more confident to use their techniques in the future. As I mentioned, there's some bonus content over at the Patreon from a handy compression rack to a PDF that should help out. And I've included a bonus video as well to help you understand these features further. Thanks so much for tuning in and I'll catch you guys next time. Bye.